This week I learned there is no reading slump deep enough that Blake Crouch cannot help pull me out of. Hey, what's up, bookworms? Mike back with another weekly update, guys, that we have into the month of April here in the States. I am very, very excited. Actually, we're thinking it's April everywhere, isn't it? Not just in the States. It's weird how time works. It's just, it's just a stubborn thing like that. But since this weekly update is off to a roaring start, let's go ahead and dig into it, guys. Let's begin, like always, talking about what am I reading? Did finish a book. I know it's the first time in a couple weeks I can say that. I finished Priest of Lies. And here's the thing, guys. It's more of the same. And that's a good thing because I did love that first book. This does very much continue, but it does make a couple of changes into the locale. Now, I won't lie. There was something that they do in this book where Tomas is trying to be in a part of you know higher society. So he's having to kind of go to some of these uh, aristocratic events and things like that. And I got a little scared because honestly, guys, this is what happened with Witcher is you took Geralt out of the monster hunting off of the questing phase and took him into society and balls and things like that. And that's where the series kind of lost me. So I got worried when that happened. But fear not, it all pays off and it all does very well. And I think what I am really enjoying about this is Thomas just keeps realizing more and more anytime he starts to trust someone, he's clearly trusting the wrong people. And I think that there are some things where, you know, hey, you are going to maybe start to fall in love with someone if you spend enough time with them. And you realize that they may actually be something that is very, very bad for you. But I continue to say, guys, that the crux of the story for me is what is going on with Billy the Boy. That is my favorite character in the series. I want so much more. I've got so many questions about this character, but it's it's good. That and the relationship between Thomas and Bloody Ann always gets better and better. But I do feel like they that, that one kind of took a step back in this book because they are apart from each other a good chunk in this book. But uh, yeah, Billy, that's the, that's the story I want to know what's going on. But I, I continue to love the relationship between Thomas and Billy, very much that father and son kind of thing. But I really am digging this series and I'll be continuing with it this month and cannot wait because it is very... Very good, guys. But I have to give some credit to my main man, Blake Crouch, because, uh, yeah, I think it took me still almost the whole week to finish that. I read 50% of this book in one day because, I mean, it's Blake Crouch, guys. The thing was, is like even Blake himself, he was actually messaging me that he was kind of nervous about me starting this because I think it's one of his least favorite books he's written. Now, as I'm reading it, I can tell you, yes, he's a much more polished writer now. You can very much tell it was very much early in his writing career. Now, look. It's worlds better than me. It's worlds better than a lot of people. I'm not I'm not criticizing him that way. I'm just saying, if you're reading his books in reverse order, like I have been, yeah, you can tell. This isn't this it's hard to look at and say, hey, yeah, this is the same guy that wrote Dark Matter. It's it's but the thing is, is it still retains all those qualities I love about a Blake Crouch story. It is a mile a minute, it is heart pounding, it has a hook that grabs you right away and you want to know what's going on, and it never slows down. His books continue to just be non-stop thrill rides. To me, that's the guy uh, that I wanted to replace Michael Crichton, and he is doing that in every way. But this uh, another fun, fun adventure. To me, I, I can already say this probably isn't going to pass up some of my favorites by him, but I do really much enjoy where the story is going, and I'm having a good time. And I've already got a lot of questions, but I am just along for the ride for this. So I imagine I'll finish this probably next time I sit down with it because it does read super fast, like all Blake Crouch books do. But uh, yeah, this is the one where I deemed, okay, it looks like the reading slump is a finally a dead because Blake Crouch always is undefeated in that regard. He's always able to pull me out of that reading slump hole that I kind of find myself falling into every once in a while. So the only thing I'm worried about, guys, is I'm running out of Blake Crouch books. I think I've only got a couple after this that I haven't read yet. So I did message him and tell him, I need you to write faster. You know, he is working on Dark Matter, the TV show with Apple right now, but he does assure me he is writing some things. But uh, yeah, I would recommend it. I think already, again, you go into it expecting. It's one of those I'm saying, I'm probably not going to recommend that you start with some of these. But Blake Crouch, start with Dark Matter, start with Recursion, or start with the Wayward Pines trilogy. That's the place to start with Blake Crouch. But this is very much a, a cool book if you are a Blake Crouch veteran at this point. So again, I'm running out of Blake Crouch books and I am a little nervous about that. But let's move along, guys, to what am I going to read? Obviously, like I said, I'm going to finish Snowbound. I don't imagine it will take me that much longer to finish that one. Probably won't start until Monday because there's a lot going on this weekend. But uh, I do plan to start back on the Into the Multiverse stuff with some dream 
Catcher. This is going to be the first time I've read this since 2001 when it first came out. This is my my first edition that I got when uh, it was like the day that uh, it was released. I went up to the store and got it because if you guys don't know, this was the first book that Stephen King wrote post accident. You know, when he had that accident, like I, I, I kind of show my age with this one is that at the time, all we had were bulletin board systems. And we actually went on message boards, and the rumor going around was that Stephen King had died. So it's kind of got to that point for a day where we thought, we're never getting another Stephen King book again. So everything that he wrote, the next thing that he wrote after that was going to be, I'm just so happy that I got to read another Stephen King story. So all of the shade that this book gets, it's kind of confused me. I was like, did I read a different book than everyone else? Did Am I just like remembering nostalgic because I felt like it has several things from other books of his. Now, look, I will admit, I do think when I was reading, I did think mm, something very derivative about this. Feels like there's a little bit of shine in here. Feels like there's a little bit of it in here. Feels like there's a little bit of body. But I love those things that Stephen King does. And I do feel like he will recycle some other storylines every once in a while. But I can understand that criticism. The criticism I don't understand is just people say this is like one of the worst Stephen King books because in my memory, I liked it a lot. So it'll be interesting to see how I feel about it upon revisiting. It's just a beautiful cover, ain't it? I love that cover. That cover is just great. Anyhow, uh, yeah, so I'm excited to dive back into this and get back going on into the multiverse because I do have, uh, well, I'm going to be doing thinner sometime this month for the multiverse. And then in May, I'll be studying, uh, I'll be, I don't want to say studying, I'll be actually doing some special things for the yeah, You Like It Darker, his short story collection that's coming out. And I'll be doing like mini minisodes. Is that what they call minisodes? Webisodes? What do you want to call them? There's mini episodes of Into the Multiverse talking about that. I haven't actually gotten in touch with Jaime yet, but I was going to see if Jaime Escalante, and Jaime Escalante, <laughs> I do that every time. Jaime Escalante is uh, Edward James Olmos from that movie of uh, Stand Deliver, that was called. My wife my wife does this. Every time we watch Battlestar Galactica and she sees Edward James Olmos, she calls him Jaime Escalante to the point to where I just started calling him Jaime Escalante. So uh, Jaime me and Fuego from the horror show. That is my my uh, brother from another mother when it comes to all things Stephen King. He is my side. He's the one I think I go to when I have a question about Stephen King. Jaime always knows the answer. So I was actually going to see if I could get some collaborative thing going with him. Maybe I can be on hail to Stephen King finally, maybe. I don't know. We haven't really talked in a bit. Uh, so I, do, I, I love to talk to Jaime. Every time I could talk to him about Stephen King, I feel like we could fill up hours and hours of film talking about Stephen King. But I wanted to see if maybe I could get with him. And now now I put him on the spot and I feel terrible. Uh, but I'm hoping I can get him on the channel or I can go on his channel so we can talk about some of these episodes of uh, You Like It Darker that's coming out because there is supposed to be a sequel to Cujo in there. So that could be very exciting because I love Cujo and Jaime famously did not like Cujo. So maybe we could talk about those things. But uh, yeah, exciting times ahead for Stephen King. King fans. If I get, to, I doubt. I mean, that's a big book, uh, Dreamcatcher. And just because I said I feel like the reading slump's uh, finally starting to roll over. Because guys, in case you don't know, the kitchen's done. The kitchen is finally done. We are back to our normal lives. All that's left is the painting, and that's a that's a DIY. We're doing that ourselves, so we don't have to worry about depending on anybody for that. But yeah, we are back to fully operational in our kitchen now. It's very exciting. So it does feel like yes, a weight has been lifted, and we can get back to our, our regular routines. But uh, Streets of Laredo is what I have on deck after that. Uh, but uh, again, I, I, I would be stunned if I got through all of Dreamcatcher this week because that is a chunky book and I am just starting to get back in to the groove. But how about this week on the channel? Did a couple of things. I started, I think, with a wrap up of March and naming my book of the month. If you watch the weekly update, I don't ever think the book of the month is going to be a shock to you. I think maybe it might have been a surprise because it was one that I kind of broke over. Shogun and Blackwater, I, bro I broke up over months, you know, so it was kind of, I moved things around and that way I could, uh, you know, give both of them a book of the month. And that wasn't actually intentional. It's just the way that it ended up falling. So I felt like it was still, you know, eligible for that winner uh, for book of the month for March. But yeah, Blackwater is something I loved and I talked about it recently and I was very, very pleased with Blackwater, and it was not a hard pick for me to pick that as my my book of the month. But uh, looking at other things on the channel for the month, I had some some interesting results. If you dived into some of the analytics there, it was uh, really, really interesting about some of the things that were hits and some of the things that were misses for the month of March. But it's always a learning experience in this channel, and I am glad to uh, look at that and be totally transparent with you guys about how the channel 
is growing and some things that might be struggling with and things that I feel like I can do better as a content creator. I talked about this beautiful uh, Lovecraft, uh, it was an HP Lovecraft manuscript of At the Mountains of Madness, which is one of my favorite Stephen King, or sorry, Stephen King, one of my favorite Lovecraft stories. What is wrong with me today? I, I look at this, I'm looking at the Stephen King book while I'm talking about Lovecraft. Okay. Uh, so uh, At the Mountains of Madness, I actually put together kind of, I wanted to show that book off a little bit, but I want to put a little ambiance to it. So I actually did like a reading for at the Mountains of Madness, because I actually didn't do one when I reviewed At the Mountains of Madness several years ago. So I kind of wanted to put that together and just kind of show some of those pages over it. Really quick video. It was nothing that uh, they asked, SP Books asked me to do. They just, they, they contacted me and said, hey, we really do love your channel. Well, can we send you something? And I was like, yeah, sure. I'll always take more Lovecraft stuff. But I was just kind of blown away by just how impressive of an addition that was. And I don't usually, I'm not really interested in stuff like that. But when you can go back and you look at his own handwriting and correspondence with other authors and peers while he was coming up with that story, very, very interesting stuff. And to be able to look at it in his own handwriting is just so much fun. It was really, really a handsome addition. And uh, it's, it's not cheap. But I just want to make sure that I did show it to people because I do love that story. And that manuscript looked really great. And if you're a collector, a Lovecraft collector, that's a, that's a, that's a dream article right there. It's really good. And then I did my book review for the week, which was Shogun, which you know is my leading candidate for book of the year right now. That is an amazing, amazing book. And I, I, what I dubbed it in that is that it is my favorite historical book, historical fiction book ever even over Pillars of the Earth, which I adore. So that's how, you know how, how much that meant to me, that Shogun was just that good. So I feel like there's a whole lot of interest now in Shogun because of the adaptation that's currently airing that is going to be, it's been just acclaimed universally through uh, you know critics and from audiences, which is extremely rare. But uh, I am very, very happy that more people are getting interested in that. I've had some people watch that review like, hey, I'm watching the show right now. I had no idea it was a book. And I'm like, well, hey, now is the time for sure. But I know that's, it's not going to be a book for everyone, mostly because of the size. It's 1,300 pages, and that scares a lot of people off. It scared me off for years. That's why that and Lonesome Dove were on my bucket list for far, far too long. And what do you know? Both of those are some great, great books I did enjoy quite a bit. But uh, yeah, I can't talk enough about Shogun. I did. I, I spent a lot of time doing the reading excerpt for that one because I do think there was so many banger lines. And obviously, you got 1,300 pages. You got some great lines to pick from. But Clavel, uh, underrated when it comes to talking about his prose. Everybody just talks about like his world building. I get not his world building, but just describing what life was like at that time period, and especially for a Stranger in a Strange Land. But his prose is actually quite beautiful, and his dialogue is really great. And I had so many great lines of dialogue highlighted while I was reading that and actually narrowing that down to a two minute reading excerpt was kind of tough, but uh, I'm happy that I did it. And I'm happy that, uh, that people, more people are going to be picking that book up and checking it out for the first time because it is quite a journey and is a journey well worth taking. I do think for some next week plans, got a couple of things on the docket. One's kind of a wait and see. Still trying to see. I'm try, trying to collect some assets and see if I can actually do this one. First, just going to be my, my book haul for March, which I'm looking at the stack on the floor right now. Got some incredible stuff that I want to show you guys and talk about and give some thanks to for some lovely, lovely viewers and publishers and authors that sent me some things in March. There are just so many great things. There are some things I picked up for myself, which we shall talk about. Again, I don't need to tell you what a book haul is about. I think everyone knows at this point. But uh, I always love doing them. It generates such great conversation, and I love to have those conversations. Now, the the maybe is I'm trying to get together some artwork because I want to do a Why You Should Read for a fantasy series I truly do love. It's a top 10 fantasy series of all time for me. And it was one that I did relatively early on this. And for a lot of people have given me credit for them actually picking up this series because I, I was covering in the early phases of this channel. And that is Faithful and the Fallen by John Gwynn. I was thinking about doing a Why You Should Read for it because I still get so many people being like, you know, hey, I, I've heard you talk about it, but you know, can you sell it to me? And I think I can do that. I think I could do that pretty well. Uh, it's a series I've, I finished back in, uh, gosh, I think 2020 and it hasn't really left my head since. It's just been so great. I've enjoyed uh, the other series of Blood and Bone that takes place in the Banished Lands, but Faith and the Fallen will always be kind of special to me. The holdup is there's not a lot of art out there for me to do a reading excerpt for it. So I actually got in touch with the Gwens, uh, John, of course, and then his his boys, Ed and Will, and asked if they could help me out getting some art. And they've got me a few things, but uh, I'm, I'm hoping I can get enough together to actually do a reading. Because I, I, like, excerpt readings are fun, but when you can only just look at like the book covers, I don't feel like it's as fun, but I'll see what I can put together. But there's sadly, there's not a lot of art out there for it. I think he, they've been sending me some stuff out from the Grim Oak 
uh, production that was done for those. So uh, it really just depends on what all I can get, but I will be putting something together for that. And I'd love to talk about one of my favorite fantasy series of all time and how much I miss that crew and how much those characters will always just stick right here because truth and courage is more than just a fancy catchphrase. It is a way of life, damn it. We're going to talk about it hopefully next week. That's all I got for the books, guys. Got a couple of TV and movie talk things before I go. The Fallout premiere, the original series coming out for Prime Video. That does come out on the 11th. And I think if I read it correctly, it's a full season drop. It's not going to just be uh, parts it's, or episodes weekly. It's going to be a full season drop, which I thought that Prime wasn't really doing. Uh, Prime Video, the record's kind of spotty with me. You know, I feel like their fancy stuff, uh, I hated Rings of Power. Wheel of Time was just a huge crushing disappointment. Uh, but, you know, then I feel like their their cops, uh, their, their police thrillers, and their political dramas are really good. I loved Reacher. Reacher's one of my favorite shows on right now. Terminal List was good. Bosch was really good. I really like The Boys. You know, so I feel like there's lots of things they do well. Fantasy, they just haven't really done well. So I feel like this being a video game adaptation kind of is in the middle somewhere. So I'm still hopeful for it. This is, uh, I forget which Nolan it is. It's not Christopher Nolan. I think it's his brother that's actually doing it. And there were the red flags that came up like usual uh, with them saying, well, we knew we couldn't please the fans. So they said my favorite line. We decided to do our own thing, which always terrifies me. But I think Todd Howard from Bethesda has talked about how, you know, he's a consultant on the show. So they're staying within the parameters of the canon. So to me, okay, if you're going to tell them original stories, that's cool. I mean, obviously, these aren't characters from the games. This isn't a location from the game. So I'm okay as long as they're not changing the lore. That's fine with me. It's all good. But, you know, they did do a screening of the first two episodes. And it's been uh, positive. They're not, they're, there's still an embargo on it. They're not allowed, but they're allowed to give away the impressions. But they're not allowed to talk about what. And they've been very, very positive. And these are game fans. These are fans of the games. And I'll tell you why it's important to me, guys. Because, look, Fallout was probably the last video game that actually got me, like, so interested in that world that I was, like, going and reading, like, the history books of that, of that made-up canon. And it's just such an interesting concept. Scary. Obviously, you're dealing with the end of the world and the apocalypse. But two years, 200 years after the bombs drop. But it's just such a fun world and a sandbox to play in. I'm very, very hopeful. And I love Walton Goggins. Walton Goggins is amazing. I love him on Shield. I love him on Justify. This guy can do no wrong. I think he's amazing. Interesting that they got him playing a ghoul on the show, but I think he will crush it because the guy, he did, that's just what he does. He always does that. He's great. But I will be checking that out for sure as a fan of the game, and I'm hoping that it falls more on the Reacher side than it does on the Rings of Power side. But we shall see, guys. While we're watching this, uh, this actually, why well, this is a little late today, I started watching this documentary earlier uh, called The Texas Killing Fields. And if you guys don't know, this is a documentary on Netflix about this stretch of territory, which... In case you don't know, guys, I live in Houston, and there's a stretch of territory between Houston and Galveston, which is the closest beach to us, of Kosher Shore. There's a long stretch of just uh, not very much, it's very sparse population, small towns, a lot of fields, a lot of flooded areas, and things like that. And this is where apparently people had committed murders and started dumping bodies. Now, to this day, they still don't know, was it one person? Was it numerous people? Did they get the, hey, this is a cool place I can get away with a murder I think I went to. But what kind of hits different about it is everywhere they start naming, I'm like, yeah, I've driven through there. I mean, this guy's this is an hour from my house. It's really, it's actually kind of scary. It's really good. Look, I think all those true crime documentaries on Netflix are really good. They really are. And this is no different. It is really good. It just hits a little different when it's so close to home, when it feels like it's taking place in your backyard. Now, obviously, I got a major metropolitan city from me and things like that. But still, it's really crazy when they're like, hey, yeah, Harris County. Hey, friends went. I'm like, yeah, I've driven through these places numerous times since i've lived here so uh, but very very good i mean obviously it's it's horrifying content you're dealing with you know people losing loved ones and things like that and unsolved murders and it is another one of those with me with true crime docs like that is it's never as much the actual crime being committed that makes me mad as it is just like the police fuckery and just like how much they bungle all these cases so much it's just anyway that's a different rabbit hole altogether but uh it's a an interesting doc that i think everyone should know and it's kind of one of those things like around here is kind of taking on like a boogeyman story every time you drive to galveston you know but uh it's it's getting a little bit more of the details on it uh, is, is is very interesting and, and at a national level it's an interesting topic that i'm surprised they actually tackled as in depth as they are but it's very good i do highly recommend it uh i gotta go guys because we're about to watch wrestlemania with my kids here. It's kind of a an annual thing here. Last year, I felt like it was a really, really great learning lesson for my kids because they just got so mad that bad guys cheat 
at wrestling, you know. So uh, it, it's a, always a learning experience. But it's a great time. My kid, my oldest, is a huge Rock fan, so uh, he's he's actually enjoying the Rock as a heel. But he also loves Cody Rhodes, so it should be a fun fun night. Uh, it's I, I just I don't know why WrestleMania needs to be two nights now. I mean, I grew up all the time. We first thought when WrestleMania went to three hours, I was like, whoa, that's way too long. Now we're talking about eight hours over two nights. Yeah probably a little too long but the roster is so big you know i mean they still feel like they've got some competition but they're still the biggest show in town and uh they've, they've got a lot of talent i'm glad they're letting them have their wrestlemania moment so wrestlemania number 40 it's crazy to think it's been that long uh, i've been watching since the beginning you know it's uh it's really really wild and to think about how things have changed since then but uh you know i know not wrestling is not for everybody but it's one of those things i'll never ever grow out of and uh even though it's not as fun to me as it used to be it's fun sharing it with my kids and hearing their reactions and hearing them boo hiss you know the bad guys and things like that tis a ton of fun so i'm gonna go watch that now but guys how was your week what are you up to what are you watching what are you reading what are you you playing drop in the comments guys and let me know and i will talk to you there